This morning we'll be in the book of Revelation, beginning with chapter 1. The title of this morning's message is Open Doors. Open Doors. The book of Revelation is an absolutely wonderful book. And I've alluded to this a couple of different times. But the place of worship in the place that opens up the place of revelation in our lives. And we read in chapter 1 of Revelation, beginning in verse 9, that begins by saying, I, John, both your brother and companion in the tribulation and kingdom and patience of Jesus Christ, was on the island that is called Patmos for the word of God and for the testimony of Jesus Christ. You know, you might be a Christian, but that doesn't guarantee you from problems. You might be a Christian, but that doesn't guarantee you from being mistreated, misunderstood. You might be a Christian, and there is never any guarantee that the path would be perfectly straight without thorns, without problems, without griefs. John, who was one of the early disciples who gave up everything to follow Jesus, he gave up the family business. He gave up his future to throw in with Jesus. May I ask today, have you thrown away your future to walk with Jesus? Are you still holding on to something? Jesus has a plan for each one of us beyond our wildest dreams. That the only thing that will hinder that plan is when we're holding on to another vision, another dream. You might have a wonderful dream in your life, but I want you to know that Jesus wants to give you more. John never dreamed that he would go to the places that he did with Christ. Now mind you, he never dreamed that he would be banished on an island either. But even though he was banished on that island, Jesus was with him. May I say to you today, wherever you find yourself today, if you will look to him and live a life of worship, he will be with you. Because that worship and prayer will open up the windows of heaven for his presence to be with you. You do not ever, ever need to be alone. Verse 10, chapter one of the book of Revelation says this. I was in the spirit on the Lord's day and I heard behind me a loud voice as a trumpet. How many of you know that's going to be loud? That's going to jar you when something is behind you and there's a voice, the sound of the trumpet. Now for effect, I want to share just a moment how I think that might have sounded. There was a voice behind me as a trumpet saying, I am the Alpha and Omega. How many of you know that's going to jar you just a little bit when you weren't expecting it? I am the first and the last. What you see, write in a book and send it to the seven churches which are in Asia, to Ephesus, to Smyrna, to Pergamos, to Thyatira, to Sardis, to Philadelphia, and to Laodicea. Then I turned to see the voice that spoke with me. And having turned, I saw seven golden lampstands. And in the midst of the seven lampstands, one like the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to his feet, girded about the chest with a golden band. His head and his hair were white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes like a flame of fire. His feet were like fine brass, as if refined in a furnace, and his voice as the sound of many waters. And he had in his right hand seven stars, and out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword. And his countenance was not like the sun shining in strength. This is not the Jesus meek and mild that he saw. This is not the Jesus that he saw that he walked the earth with, that they they ate together and drank together and walked dusty roads with. He got an inkling of Jesus, what he must have been like in heaven at the transfiguration. You remember on the mount 
he and Peter and James are there with, with Jesus. And all of a sudden, what appeared to them was Moses and Elijah. And Jesus was shining brighter than any, than any laundry person can make things white. And they were amazed at what they saw. What he saw here was far grander than anything that he had seen before. He saw the glorified Christ in all of his glory and all of his majesty, or at least as much as is humanly able to see. This is not a limp wrist Jesus saying to people, there, there, just be nice. It'll all be well. This is the God of glory and majesty who when he speaks, people listen. Demons listen, angels listen, even the rocks listen. And he spoke these things to John. And when John saw him, it was, it was beyond anything he had ever seen before. And verse 17 says, and when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead. I don't know what it's going to be like to see Jesus for the first time glorified in heaven. You've heard me say this before. There's many who would say, when I get to heaven, I'm going to raise my finger and say, I got some questions for you, Jesus. I believe that when we will see him, the only thing we're going to be able to do is fall on our faces because our breath will be taken away because of his goodness, his majesty, his holiness. How many of you want to see that? I do. I'm looking forward to that. I'm looking forward to that day. I fell at his feet as dead, but he laid his right hand on me, saying to me, Do not be afraid. I am the first and the last. I am he who lives and was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And I have the keys of Hades and of death. I am the first and the last. Sing with me. You are Lord of heaven, Lord of earth, Lord of all that ever shall be, Lord of heaven, Lord of earth, Lord of all that is to Father, we thank you this day that you are indeed the first and the last. You always were, Lord God, and you always shall be. And we are your children, Lord God. And Father, I know that you bid us to come, and we come, O oh Lord God. Give us our marching orders, O oh God. Father, we overcome, and we come against every fear and every doubt that would say, but what if I give my whole life to Jesus? We cast that aside this day, because, Lord God, we choose to follow you in all of your glory and all of your majesty. You are our king, and we are your servants. Father God, I pray today that a holy boldness would begin to fall upon us that, Lord God, we might not be afraid of man ever again or what people think. All we will care about, Lord God, is what you think. Come, Spirit of the Lord, and fill us, we pray. In Jesus' name. Praise the Lord. It was a Sunday. Thank you so much, ladies. It was a Sunday morning that John was on this island. And in the midst of that Sunday morning, he began to worship and he had the windows op of heaven open to him unlike anything he ever saw before. He was not expecting it. May I say to you, would you expect the unexpected? Expect that when you worship, expect that when you pray, expect when you take the Word of God morning by morning and open it, that the unexpected is going to happen because the Lord God is looking for a people to speak to. Scripture tells us that God looks to and fro through all the earth to find a people who are wholly His. May I ask today, whose people, who are the people that are wholly His? Who are the people that are wholly God's? There should not be any hesitation, but there should be a cry that rises up that says, We are those people, O oh God. We are those people, O oh God. 
Come and look upon us, Lord. We want to be those people that are full of revelation and full of your spirit. When we think of the book of Revelation, we think oftentimes of, of end times. We think of the demise of Satan, the Antichrist, the great falling away. We think of final judgments. We think of earthquakes and, and, and angels proclaiming in heaven and, and all sorts of things. But the book of Revelation begins with a man banished because of his faith. Banished on a lonely rock of an island that is in the Aegean Sea, east of Greece, just off the coast of Turkey, modern-day Turkey. He finds himself on this, this colony, this, this remote place, this place of banishment, a place where he could have been feeling sorry for himself that particular Sunday. But instead of that, he chose to worship. I think too often we feel sorry for ourselves and our predicament and our plight. What in the world do we have to feel sorry for? Oh, pastor, you just don't understand. No, I don't understand, but I know that Jesus does. Scripture tells us that we can come boldly to the throne of grace to find help in time of need. We can come with, with all of our cares and all of our issues and all of our problems. But here's the deal. Too often we come with them and we likewise we leave with them. Well, pastor, the situation hasn't changed. For us to not feel sorry for ourselves, we've got to leave our condition, our problems, and our circumstances at the cross with Jesus. Because he's the only one that can deal with them. I can't make myself well. I can't, I can't make things right in circumstances, but I can come before him and I can bring all of my needs and all of my cares and I can lay them down before him. You know the thing I find amazing? When I go to third world countries, if I go to the poor in Mexico or in Guatemala or in Africa, I see people with nothing whose hearts are full. And too often, may I say this, and I'm not going to say it in a condemning, just please hear my heart. Too often in America, our hands are full, but our hearts are empty. I'm not asking that it be changed, that our hands are empty. But I'm asking that in this day, with hearts that are turned to Jesus, no matter what our circumstance, that our hearts would be full of his goodness, his glory, and his presence. We find in the book of Revelation a man that's banished there because of his testimony. In the days in which we live, there are brothers and sisters of ours across the world who are losing their lives because of their testimony. A number of Christians were forced to kneel down on a beach in Libya and beheaded because of their faith. You know, that's where the rubber strikes the road. Here, we might get in trouble at work or at school. We might have people frown on us. But may God give us courage to shine as a light. I'm not telling us to be obnoxious. I'm not saying to jump up in the middle of something when something else has gone, gone on and, I don't know, scream out the Lord's Prayer or something like that. But I am saying to shine as a light, not to back down whenever there is an opportunity. And not to be afraid just because there are threats in case we speak about the goodness of the Lord. It's going to take courage today to change our nation. But the Spirit of God will breathe life into the courageous. Well, I don't have much courage. That's okay. Just come to Jesus. Just ask Him for courage. I'll tell you what, it had to take courage on His part to go to the cross because He knew what He was up against. He knew what it was, what it was going to cost Him. He is the most courageous, courageous human being that ever lived was Jesus because he knew what was going to happen on the cross, but he saw beyond the cross. May God give us eyes to see beyond. So we read in the book of Revelation, it begins with seven letters that Jesus asks John to send to seven churches. Seven letters to seven churches. Austin, could I ask you to bring up that glass of water for me, please? Because I will be parched here in a moment. When they were moving the pulpit this morning, I realized there's a glass of water there. Thank you. And if I don't pull it out of the way, there will be an accident. He writes these letters to seven churches that are in present modern day Turkey. That's where all of these churches were. And as Jesus dictates to John 
these letters to send to the different churches. There's a pattern by which he dictates these letters. Always, and you can read these, and I encourage you to read. This is found in chapters 2 and 3 of Revelation, these letters to the seven churches. Jesus always greets the churches and identifies himself. He defines the things that he knows about the church. He either then challenges the church or corrects them as needed. This is always followed by a promise. You know, no matter where it is in Scripture where the Lord might have a hard word for Israel or for someone, it always comes with a promise. We're reading right now in our Bible calendars in the book of Revelation, not Revelation, Jeremiah, excuse me, just having followed Isaiah. And those are prophetic words to the nation of Israel crying out to them to get, get your lives right or I'm going to have to bring judgment. But always there's a promise of what God really wants to do. Judgment is not something he wants. He wants to bless. You know what judgment is for? Well, it's just to, uh, man, just to give those people what they really deserve. No, judgment is always for the purpose of bringing correction to a people that they might repent and come back into a place of fellowship with him. Judgment is never vindictive on God's part. I want to get my pound of flesh because they're not doing what I said. That is never it at all. So never see judgment as that. He always gives them a promise, and he always includes in every one of the letters this phrase or a version of it. It's normally at the end. To him who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit is saying. Let me say this just on a side note, and it's not just because I'm up behind this pulpit today. When Jesus spoke on the earth and he shared parables, oftentimes he said those same things. To him who has an ear, let him hear. The, the weight and the responsibility for hearing is not on the speaker, it's on the listener. Nobody could speak better than Jesus, but a whole lot of people weren't listening. Well, maybe if he had just reworded it. Maybe if he had had some more examples. Maybe if he would have said it in a different tone of voice. He said, no. The responsibility to hear is upon the listener. So may I say, whoever is behind this pulpit on a given Sunday morning or Wednesday night or whenever it is, and you might think, well, I like this one better than that. I'd prefer to hear this one. Always have an ear to what the Spirit is saying because the Spirit is saying something very, very vital that each one of us need to hear. So we go into Revelation chapter 3. If you'd go just a couple chapters further. Hopefully you, you brought your Bible with you. If you did, just wave it at me, your Bible, your iPad, your phone, whatever you're using, your laptop, I, I don't care. Uh, always bring this with you. Uh, we want, I put some of the uh, scriptures on behind me, but I really want for you to know in the Word where these things are and to have your highlighter or your pen there so you can make notes even in your Bible. Revelation chapter 3, verse 7 begins this way, and it says, And to the angel of the church in Philadelphia write, this is not where the Phillies play, okay, or the Hall of Independence. This is in present-day Turkey. And to the angel of the church in Philadelphia write, These things says he who is holy, he who is true, he who has the key of David, he who opens and no one shuts, and shuts and no one opens. He says, I know your works. See, I've set before you an open door, and no one can shut it. For you have a little strength have kept my word and have not denied my name. Indeed, I will make those of the synagogue of Satan who say they are Jews and are not, but lie. You know, not everybody who says they are a Christian are, is that right, are a Christian? Not everyone who says they are a Christian are a Christian. I, it might not be right. You teachers, maybe you can help me with that. The point is, just because I say it doesn't necessarily mean it is. I would always ask my my grandson's this, and I'll have an opportunity to ask the granddaughters as they get older. How do you know that I love you? And I would oftentimes have them say early on, because you tell me all the time. And I would say to them, no. It's by what I do. It's by how I treat you. That's how I know. How do I, how do I know who's a Christian and who's not? Not by what you say. It's by what you do and how you live your life. So there were, there were people there who were resisting, who the Lord said, they say they're Jews, but they're not. It's a lie. Indeed, I will make them come and worship before your feet and to know that I have loved you. Verse 10. 
Because you have kept my command to persevere, I will, also, I will keep you from the hour of trial, which shall come upon the whole, whole world to test those who dwell on the earth. Behold, I'm coming quickly. Hold fast what you have, that no one may take your crown. He who over, you know, may I just say this? The Lord will give you revelation. The God, Lord will put things in your life. The Lord will plant the good things of the, of, of the Lord in you. There will be things that begin to change. There will begin to be things that you see clearly of the Lord that you've never seen before. But there's always the birds of the air waiting to steal that from you, to steal that seed, to steal that treasure that God has put in your heart. Do not ever let Satan steal from you what God has put in. How do I know that happens? You can come to youth camp and the Lord does a number on your heart and soul and you're changed. And three weeks later, you find you're the same. You can go to the men's advance or the ladies advance and just, oh, you've been transformed. And the, the enemy is waiting to steal that from you. You can have something marvelous happen in a church service or on the mission field and the enemy is waiting. Scripture makes it real clear real clear to be careful to hold fast what you have that no, no one may take away what the Lord has planted in your life never stand for that we were youth pastors years ago in a church in another city just had a, a, a youth advance take place I think we did it with uh, I know we did we did it with uh, the church that Pastor Dave and Vivian were a part of we always partnered with them and there was a young man in the youth group who came back on fire. And what did I hear from his family? Man, he really got weird. We'll wait a little while and, and it'll, it'll go back to normal. And it did. And that was the most tra one of the most tragic things I ever saw. The fire he caught from the negative things that, that family and friends said. He abandoned what, he, what had gone into his life. This morning, I want you to go away with a number of things, but at least one. What has God said to you today? If you don't feel that he said anything, then I, I dare say ask again because there's something he wants to say. Write that down. Make a note of it. Take it home with you. God, you said this today. That's why I write in my Bible all over the place. I do not want to forget what God has said to me. And then when I come around on my Bible calendar the following year, I'm reminded again, this is what God said. And I, and I agree again. I lay hold of it because I'm not letting go of all that he has said. Verse 12, he who overcomes, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God. He shall go out no more. I will write on him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which comes down out of heaven from my God. Verse 13. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. The city of brotherly love, which is what Philadelphia is always called, if you've ever heard that before. The name Philadelphia speaks of brotherly love. It speaks of loyalty. It, it speaks of affection. This city, city by the name of Philadelphia was founded by a king who had a brother who earned the title of Philadelphus. This brother to the king was so loving and so loyal to the king. He was so steadfast to the king. Oftentimes you will find in, in history that if one brother is a king, the whole time another brother is trying to usurp his kingdom and to take over. But this brother was different. This brother was loyal to his elder brother, the king, and with deep, deep affection. So much so that when the king established the city, he named it after his brother and called it Philadelphia. And when you read about the seven churches, to each one of those churches, God speaks something right to where that church is. Something that those people in that church would go, ah, oh, I know what you're talking about. So, as the name Philadelphia speaks of loyalty and love, Jesus says to them in verse 8, that first of all, he knows their works. He knows that, he says that in a positive sense. He says, they have kept his word, they have not denied him, they have been loyal to him. Verse 10, he says, they have kept his command to persevere. 
In other words, he was saying to them, you live in a city named after love and loyalty, and you have proven yourselves to be loyal to me out of your love. They understood where he was going. But then he says something amazing in verse 8. He says, because of your love for me, because of your loyalty to me, because you refuse to be swayed, listen to me, you refuse to be swayed to follow the culture. There was a culture then as there is today screaming at the top of their lungs, follow me, follow me, we know the way, but the truth is the culture doesn't have a clue and the culture is being led by hell itself for the purpose of dragging the culture off of a cliff and into the pits of, of hell. That is the purpose of what we see much of going on today. Now before you're horribly offended by that, all you have to do is look at the results of the direction that the culture is going today. All you have to look is at the news or a newspaper or your internet news service and see that there's a lot of destruction going on. Is that destruction set about by the presence of God or is it set about by a culture that has followed the God of this world? And what Jesus is saying to Philadelphia is, you've proven yourself to be loyal, you've proven yourself to be loving, you've refused to follow the culture of the day. And he says, because of that, I'm opening a door before you. Church, may I say, as we follow the ways of God and we follow his leading, no matter what the culture says, see, tolerance is a one-way street in the day in which we live. There are many who would say, you've got to be tolerant. Tolerant is a one-way street. What that means is tolerance is tolerated if you go in the direction of the culture. If you are going the opposite direction of the culture, there is no such thing as tolerance. So, so what the Lord is saying is that if you will continue to follow me and not follow the dictates of this culture, I will open a door before you. So the question is, where does that door lead? What kind of door are we talking about? I'm going to throw some scriptures at you very, very quickly. You'll see them on the board. You can write them down, the address, if you'd like to look at them later. Acts 14, verse 27. After Paul and Barnabas returned from their first missionary trip, they came and reported to the church in Antioch. Verse 27 says, Upon arriving in Antioch, they called the church together and reported everything God had done through them and how he had opened the door of faith to the Gentiles too. God had opened a door of faith that they were able to walk through. 2 Corinthians 2.12, Paul again says, When I came to the city of Troas to preach the good news of Christ, the Lord opened a door of opportunity for me. Oh, Lord, may you open a door of opportunity for us. A door of opportunity to... To, to shine as a light, to share the gospel that many, many, many would come to Christ. There's a dying, hurting world that's just waiting for somebody to share with them. They may not look like it. They may not look like you would expect them to look like. But there's a whole bunch of folks hungry. They just don't know what they're hungry for. Colossians chapter 4, verse 2 and 3 says this. Continue earnestly in prayer, being vigilant, vigilant in it, with thanksgiving. Let me say that when we pray, no matter what our circumstance and need is, it must be full of thanksgiving. It must be full of praise. Too often, uh, prayers can be full of our needs. Lord, I, I just can't take it anymore. How much more are you going to put on it? Lord, are you ever going to forgive? Lord, everything is awful. And it could be nothing but, I'm sorry, the woe is me's. Nobody's seen the trouble I've seen. I've got it really bad. But that isn't how we come before the Lord. We can be honest. If you read the Psalms, how many times did David come brokenhearted? Right. Lord, I don't know what's going on, but he gathers a hold of himself. But Lord God, I know who you are. I know your plan and purpose for my life. And Lord, so in spite of what's happening here, I'm going to look up. I'm going to look up and I'm going to begin to praise and worship you. I think if we come before the Lord in a spirit of thanksgiving, I think we'll have a whole lot more prayers answered. A whole lot more. Not to mention, 
The prayers of our wife, our husbands might be answered too. Gosh, they're not as grumbling and complaining anymore as they were. They're, they're beginning to give thanks. Who we are, the spirit within us, kind of permeates everyone around us, changed the whole atmosphere of our house. There were times when I was a salesman years ago, and, and it wasn't easy. And I'd come home with a big cloud over my head, and Lord would say, you know, maybe you should go back out and come back in when you get, get rid of that. We can, we can bring a cloud that just absolutely crushes our whole family. We have to decide what kind of people we're going to be. Full of joy, full of his presence, full of thanksgiving, even though there are needs. Colossians 4, 2 through 3. Continue earnestly in prayer, being vigilant in it with thanksgiving. Meanwhile, praying also for us that God would open to us a door for the word to speak the mystery of Christ, for which I am also in chains. Father, we ask today that you would open up a door for the word as Pastor Dave and Levi are in Uganda even now. That you would open up doors of faith, doors of opportunity, and doors of the word, Lord God. That, that they might run through it and the word of God would be affected to 30, 60, and 100 fold. Father, we even ask today, Lord God, that, that opposition, we command opposition to stand to the side in Jesus' name. And that there would be a free running of them to do all that you've called them to do. In Jesus' name, amen. The preaching of the word and prayer and worship go together. You're seeing that today. Worship and prayer and the word, they all follow in together. And as you see in this scripture in Colossians chapter 4, Peter, Paul is talking about praying vigilantly with thanksgiving. And at the end of the verse, he says, even though I'm in these chains, you don't hear a word of complaint by him. He goes, I might be in chains, but God's got a work for me to do in these chains. I don't know if I've told you the story before. 20 some odd years ago, I, I was in Zimbabwe for the first time, uh, out in the rural areas, out in the bush in the middle of nowhere. And Simon said, I, Simon McCullough, how many of you remember him? He's an apostle in the Wangi area. He said to me, go ahead and take my, my uh, what was driving, a Land Rover, right hand side drive, left hand side shift, driving on the left hand side of the road, as the English do. He says, take my Land Rover, go back into the main city and go pick up some people to bring them out here. I said, okay, I'll, I'll do that. Now I want you to know, Pastor Bob is like an expert in driving on the left-hand side of the road. I, this last trip to Zimbabwe, I was in awe. It was amazing. <laughs> Peter Shengaj only let me drive when we were out in the rural areas and there was no traffic. It was a wise decision. So anyhow, I said to Simon, I said, Simon, uh, where's the jack? You know, because I want to be prepared. Uh, I don't have a jack. Okay. Where's the spare tire? Don't have a spare tire. Okay. So, I mean, well, I'm a long ways away from where I have to go over dirt roads, rocky roads, etc. Uh, Simon, what do you do if you get a flat tire? He says, I just assume that this is where God wants me to be right now. To which I replied to Simon, I said, oh, Simon, I think you've got more faith than I do, but okay, I'll go. And I, I want you to know there were no flat tires by the grace of God. Uh, one time he did get a flat. It took him three days to find him out in the middle of nowhere. I think they sent the army or something, went to find him. But, but a, a man of faith who trusted. Here was, here was Paul believing that though he's in the midst of chains, God has him there for a reason. So many places that we can go. 1 Corinthians 16, 8 through, 8 through 9 says this. Paul again saying, In the meantime, I will be staying here at Ephesus until the festival of Pentecost. There is a wide open door for a great work here, although many oppose me. I want you to know that God wants to open doors to us. He wants to open doors of opportunity to us to touch the world, to touch nations. There was a door of opportunity opened up so that Pastor Dave and Levi could be in Uganda right now. They're doing what God has called them to do because they walked through an open door. It would have been much easier to see that open door and go, that's cool. 
and done something else. We've sent teams over the years to Africa. It's been much easier for them to say, let somebody else go, but they went. I have no predetermined idea of what God is calling you to, but God is setting before you an open door. Do you want that open door before you? Just a few of you do, because some of you, I'm sure, are thinking. Some of you today, they're going to have, you're going to have a, a whole wide range of people today. Some of which would say, Pastor, keep your open door. I got a life. And, and okay, I, I, I don't discount that. I, I've walked in that place. Years and years ago, Lori and I probably, I didn't even if Lori had hit 20 yet. We were married. We were two little kids playing house when we got married. And by the grace of God, three months after we got married, we met Pastor Dave and Pastor Vivian. That was a God deal. I had nothing to do with that one. And between the Holy Spirit and Pastor Dave's strong arms, they never let us go. Something I'm very grateful for. But every Thanksgiving, they used to take their youth group at a church in Ontario to uh, uh, an event. It was called World Map. It was a big conference thing over the Thanksgiving weekend. They always went, man, they were charged up, ready to go. And my thinking was, cool, but I am not giving up my Thanksgiving weekend to go to a conference somewhere. There's probably some things that we missed because of that. Not probably, I'm sure there is. There are open doors be before us, and some of us can look at those doors and go, that's cool for you, Pastor, but, but I, I got other things to do. I, I don't condemn it. That's fine. God changed my mind after a while. May he change yours also. There's others of us that will look through that, and they'll be terrified as we look through that open door wondering, what is on the other side? Jesus, will you tell me what's on the other side? And Jesus says, just come through the door. I'll go with you. I'll go with you. And some of us are praying, oh God, open some doors. Open some doors into this city. Open some doors into my neighborhood. Open some doors into family members who don't know you. Open some doors, oh God, that I might walk through them and make something of a difference in this earth today before I go to glory. You see, I don't want to just live my life and do my thing and be gone. Praise God, I got mine. I got my salvation. But Lord God, would you use me? Can you say that where you're at? Lord, use me. Use me. Because he wants to use each and every one of us. My goodness. You know, to one other church in Revelation chapter 2, the church in Ephesus, Jesus spoke to them and he says, but I, you've done all these things good, but I got this one thing, this one thing. I, I do not want to hear. Elver, I love you. You've done a good work, but I got this one thing. If there is one thing, Lord God, may I say, can we talk about it now and not at the end of my life? So we can get this one thing squared away. He said to the church in Ephesus, I've got one thing. He said, the problem is, you don't love me as much as you used to. You used to love me dearly. The open door that God wants to bring to us, I believe only opens through our love and our devotion to Him. It opens in the midst of our worship of Him. I want to love Him more than I ever have in the past. You know, some folks come to Christ and man, the love is just so amazing because they never saw anything like this before. And it can diminish if we're not careful. I don't want just the love of when I first came to Him. I want more. I want more because I want open doors. I want you to know that even though the doors are open, there is resistance towards those doors open. There's resistance towards you going through that door. And the way to deal with resistance is to pray and to be a praying people and not just to, to cease from prayer. 
prayer is the, is, are, are the howitzers, the cannons that blows holes into the enemy lines. They, they blows holes that, that we might rush through to do what God has called us to do. Prayer. God is setting before, setting before us open doors to Rancho Christian Center and to Olive Rim. How many of you want to go through those doors? How many of you want those doors? Would you stand with me this morning? I believe that to the degree that we worship is to the degree that we love. And the degree in which we love and are devoted to God will be the degree to which doors are open to us. Spirit of the Lord, today, we offer ourselves before you again, asking, Lord God, that worship would rise in our heart, that love would rise in our hearts, and that doors would be open. Lord God, we don't even know what that means. And I'm standing here, Lord God, I don't even know what it means, but I trust you. And I know, Lord God, you want us to make a difference in the world today. Father, we pray, make a difference in our hearts today. Make a difference through us today. Father, I pray for family members that don't know you, that they might be saved. Would you just speak a family member that you know that isn't saved, that you want to see if saved? Father, as we lift up these names before you, Lord God, would you save them? Would you save them, Lord? Father, we have neighbors, we have people in our workplace, we have people at school that don't know you. Father, I pray, oh, how I pray, oh God, that you would cause us to be effective, that you would shine through us that many would come to know you, Lord God. Use us, O oh Lord, we pray. We ask it, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. There's some things for you to think about today. Would you take those things with you? I hope you took some notes so you can go back on those things. If you don't remember, look on YouTube. The, the sermon will be there on our website or on iTunes, uh, the, the audio will be there, that God might use us to change the world. And then one last thing. I'm not normally um, beating the drum for products or movies, but may I say, if you haven't seen the movie Woodlawn, see it now. Woodlawn, W-O-O-D-L-A-W-N. It has not quite received the same press as War Room, but I want you to know it's every bit as good, maybe better. Um, but we want to support these movies while they're out of the theater to tell Hollywood, this is the things we want to see, and you can keep the other stuff locked away somewhere. So if you get a chance to see that, talk about a movie of faith you will want to jump up and say praise Jesus in the middle of the theater. And if you want to, I say go ahead and do it. Go ahead and do it. God bless you. Hug, hug someone before you leave. If you like prayer, please come forward. We'd love to pray with you. God bless you.